we're going to talk about speckle today um which is quite a long story uh more or less but we'll see where we end up so let's see i hope the presentation works in full screen it's the first yeah. time uh we're using google slides so let's see what happens um we've got a short video actually this is fresh off uh let's say the press which kind of tries to describe a bit what speckle does speckle started as a kind of a very simple thing to send and receive uh ac data uh in between multiple platforms so it's a quite of a bit of a, as an interoperability platform now of course as you send this data around this data is stored in speckle and there's a bit of technical background at the end of the presentation what we're boasting on is like kind of the versioning capability so we keep track of kind of every instance that um whatever data you send through speckle and why is this cool it's because <laughs> I mean, ultimately, Speckle becomes a bit of a kind of a construction cloud. I really hate using this kind of, you know, uh, terminology. Uh, but it's a kind of open data platform that ourselves included and many others have built all sorts of various um, kind of apps and, uh, and other little scripts and automation and so on and so forth on top of. Um, now, a brief history of Speckle. So, <laughs> 2015. Um, Speckle, I started Speckle while I was a Marie Curie Fellow at UCL, a uh, lovely European Union funded project, so it was really, really nice and luxurious in, in this sense. Speckle also is open source on the kind of initial efforts that, you know, public money funding research should provide public tools. Um, it grew inside the consortium of all these logos that you see here, and it kept on growing also by virtue that it was open source and by virtue that actually the industry needed what we were producing at the time. Um, then me and Matteo, we kind of, Matteo started contributing on the way, like I think uh, early 2016 or 17. And then we both ended up like after my fellowship ended, he started working at Arrow before, and then we both ended up working at Arrow. Um, but then in 2020, uh, just at the beginning, just when we smelled the pandemic coming along, we decided to essentially establish a company around Speckle because we wanted to focus exclusively on this project. And we also wanted to maintain its uh, neutrality and independence and kind of serve the AEC industry as a whole. Yeah, and funnily enough, uh, much later, I finished my PhD thesis anyway. <laughs> Um, then features. Now I'm handing off to Matteo. Yeah, and I'll, I'll you're gonna. The yes, and you're gonna need to say next because I don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can blink if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the features of Speckle. It's uh, actually one of the <laughs> the questions we get asked the most is what is Speckle, and I think you know it's it's really hard to answer because Speckle does so many things. But maybe describing what it does in terms of features, it you know will help you understand uh, what the platform is and the potential behind it. And I like to see Speckle a bit as a Swiss Army knife. It's there's not really one thing that it does better than others. It does a lot of things. We try to summarize here some of the the main ones. And number one, I would say it's clearly uh, interoperability. Uh, as you well know, the the scenario. Um, in AC, um, it is quite fragmented in terms of AC software. So the communication between, say, um, Revit and Unity or Grasshopper or AutoCAD, it's pretty poor. And um, that's also a bit the where Echo started, trying to solve these challenges, both uh, on a technical level, but also on a human level. So how do we make communicating information from software A to software B easier? and less painful and also maybe not uh, file based since we are in <laughs> 2020 and uh, we, we wanted something new so uh, we have developed a set of connectors currently we have a few more than what you see in this slide because we have uh, if I remember correctly Revit, Rhino, Grasshopper and Dynamo, AutoCAD Civil 3D our recent additions we have a Unity connector we also have a Blender connector and an mm -hmm. unreal one uh, underway. And there's, of course, uh, additional connectors that we're planning to develop as an Excel one, um, uh, SketchUp. SketchUp, uh, please. Yes. <laughs> and we'll see. You know, 
if there's a connector that you would like to see, you know, again, let us know and we'll, we'll see if we, we can do it. Um, next slide. Yeah, so for us, interoperability is something seamless that really lets you transfer design intent from software A to software B. And here you're seeing our um, right, you know, connector on the left, the top left panel. And this is how it works. You just select some objects, you can click and receive them inside of, of Revit. And in Revit, you get native Revit elements. This is a very short More video, but it, it, yeah. yeah, it shows how simple and, and painless we want the process to be without any configuration or settings or anything like that. Uh, likewise, we have a grasshopper. Um, <laughs> we're not really showing that uh, I guess a component that behaved in a similar way was a bit more sophisticated. Uh, here, instead, we are seeing the Unity connector that is receiving data from uh, uh, Rhino. So it's, we are sending these cubes that we applied <laughs> some <laughs> graphically <laughs> modifier inside in Unity just to make it a bit more fun. But we're also showing how quite seamlessly you can then send this geometry that was being generated inside of Unity back inside of Rhino. And it's just a very simple and dummy example of you know, what you can do. There's many different applications we see in AC that would really benefit from this bi-directional connectivity between the Rhino and Unity. Um, here instead, yeah, yeah we can yeah. play. Yes, this is easy working, the easiest work of this week. So um, go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very fresh. It's our uh, Blender integration that Unity has been working on together with Tom. And in this case, we're showing how we are actually integrating as well with uh, Blender BIM. And uh, I mean, the process, that. yeah, I can talk through it. I mean, ahead, if Izzy is listen, listening and she can talk through it, but I don't think she's, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't see people anymore. Um, Okay, so what Izzy did here in this video, as you see, she's basically essentially imported an IFC file using Blender BIM into Blender. And then um, both Easy and Tom like worked quite hard in the past weeks to develop a Blender integration. And what she did, whoop, you didn't really see, and this video is kind of a bit sped up. Um, yeah, she basically sent the data that actually was imported into Blender from Blender to Speckle via the Speckle Blender connector. And as you can see here, actually, this as you yeah, cannot see, <laughs> or as you cannot see, depending on the resolution and the, the framework. Yeah, anyway, I can do, I can show this live actually, maybe. Yeah, we so can share the deck afterwards. But essentially, what you would see there is the IFC data that we, uh, the raw IFC data that was transported together with the geometry when data was being sent to Speckle. Voila, I think maybe now it's uh, ah, more visible. Sure. Yeah, so this is um, essentially the model. This is the speckle front end. That's another like kind of blah, blah, blah. You can section it, wonderful. Do all sorts of funny things inside the viewer. But I think actually the interesting part is <laughs> the data inside and how it's structured. And this is something that I expect you'll kind of hear from us a bit more, like how is it best to structure this data? Speckle's quite agnostic when it comes to how it's doing these things. Um, but there you go, IFC-based uh, kind of data inside Speckle. So that's that. I'll go back to the deck now. Do -do -do -do. Yeah. Oops. Another core feature of Speckle that was actually introduced with the newest and latest version that we were uh, currently working on, the V2 version of Speckle is versioning. Uh, now, I guess most of you are quite technical people that know how Git works and what versioning is, you know, and what it allows. It, it's not, you're not required to know what versioning is in order to use Speckle. It kind of happens behind the scenes. Every time you're sending to Speckle, uh, we're generating a commit. And we're also giving flexibility to people to structure their, their data in, in branches. So here is how you would see that in, in our front end. The front end is still a bit early stages. I think it's a bit uh, also clunky, the video. Uh, but you can see that uh, commits can be organized by, by branches. At the moment, we don't have any Git advanced functionality like merging of these branches. But you can easily merge two branches outside of Speckle in and inside one of the AC softwares, just pull the data, merge it together, and send it back either into a new branch or into a new stream. 
Yeah, and this is basically, I stopped that video because if Matteo says it's clunky, I can show actually the live stuff. So this is actually, you can see every time stuff gets pushed, in this case, always from Grasshopper, essentially we create a commit on top of that. And this is how we're exposing that to the end users. And this is kind of like a challenge that we have at the moment is to understand what are the best patterns? Because we understand that us as like, okay, former architects, more programmers now, we get Git, but, um, and the collaborative models behind Git, but how do you expose that to the AC industry at large is a completely different story. So, um, yeah, cool. And on this, uh, we are actually super open to feedback. So any of you listening yeah. or any of you that might have even tried the beta, please let us know what you think about that. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, cool. Another core feature that is just the natural, let's say, continuation of what we showed before, the, that is interoperability and versioning is actually collaboration. And by having a central server through, uh, through which all this information flows and all this data, then you know it's quite seamless to, to allow for users to collaborate together. On top of that, we have a it's quite simple at the moment in my growing complexity, quite simple permission. Um, um, based system. <laughs> based system that lets people yeah, add others as collaborators, uh, contributors, owners, reviewers, so read and write permissions on, on different streams. Yeah. And again, I mean, kind of as Speckle grows, we will try and understand which are the best patterns there, what are the best roles, and so on and so forth. There's a, um, yeah, data curation, which you mentioned, Matteo, briefly, you can select stuff. That's yeah, I think that the cool thing about this is that I think often goes under under the radar is that uh, Speckle lets you curate data quite well. So you don't have to send an entire model every time you send information, you can actually select what to send and select and decide how to organize it. So you can, if you want to send just a structural model, you can do so quite easily. If you just want to send one beam as well, if you want to send the entire model, you can also do that. And then in the future, hopefully we'll have more data curation features in the web front end, but so far it's quite um, based on the connector themselves. Yeah, and I mean, why this is important, it's because, you know, there is this kind of very, um, big concept, let's say the master model, the, the digital twin, the so on and so forth uh, in AC, which is like the source of truth of everything. And we're kind of going against that because we using Speckle, you can essentially assemble your master model from multiple, let's say models at any point in time. So you're not beholden to one big monolithic, um, you know, like kind of file or architectural place. Um, it's much more structured in a, in a sense that also like if you're working just on, let's say a subset of a building, you can just create a master model. So to say of just that specific subset overlay on top of it, you know, data coming from other places inside Speckle. So um, there's no really a constraint there. I mean, yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of working in a, in a object-based system. So since Speckle doesn't deal with yes. files, you really don't have any limitation in, you know, what to get and what to use, you know, it's just the object is not an entire file. Um, so we went through some of the main end user features, but uh, Speckle was actually developed with the developers in mind. So we are well, all- uh, it, it is now since version 2.0 more than. <laughs> let's say we, we switched the yeah. focus more on, on developers. We are AC developers ourselves. We worked, you know, creating plugins for Revit and Grasshopper in the past. And now we want others to use Peco to do the same things we were doing, but you know, with less pain and with <laughs> less effort. That's why we created a series of SDKs and APIs. We currently have published a uh, package on uh, on PIP recently, a Speco uh, Pi, which lets you access the, the API, send data, do all sort of operations. We have the .NET Core um, SDK, which is actually our canonical SDK lets you again do all sort of operations with uh, objects, conversions, uh, and again, you know, and have some nice wrappers around the API, so you can call it quite easily. Uh, we have some uh, J JavaScript packages that actually have been recently published on NPM, in particular the viewer. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a standalone viewer based on 3.js. You can reuse it in your own application. You can do whatever you want with it. It's a very permissive open source license. And finally, we have a GraphQL API that, again, it I was a bit against <laughs> GraphQL, you know, because this new technology is being rolled out. It's actually a pleasure to work with. There's a, uh, there's a GIF in the um, next slide, but you can also show it live. Ah, uh, shit. Yes, I forgot about that GIF. OK, so um, sorry. Explorer. Yes. So there you go. And I mean, the nice thing that this gives us over kind of traditional let's say uh, REST API is, is that we, with very little effort, we get everything uh, documented in a, in a nice way, right? So, and this allows us to kind of create queries on the fly really easily and bam, now I, I got my, my user ID because I'm logged in. Um, if I would want to get my streams, for example, I would be, whoops, Total count and items. Duck, for example. I can't believe I'm doing a live demo. <laughs> Name and all the stream IDs, and bam, you have all the stream IDs that are shared with me. If I want to check out what role I have in I think there. We, okay. we didn't mention it before, but in Specula, stream basically uh, represents like a repo in Git. So yeah. it's where all your uh, data goes when when you're sending something from from one connector. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, this is why we went for the kind of actually documenting our server through essentially the API itself. Um, hopefully, so, yeah, hopefully uh, that will make your life easy as well when accessing and consuming this data. Yeah, because what you just need to do is like copy paste this into a post request with your authentication token inside and you essentially have this response back out. Um, oops, no, this is the wrong place. Sorry, let me go back. To the First step. Yeah. <laughs> View. It's uh, just for, you know, it's late in London. So I had half a beer already and I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, not very coherent. There, there you go. I think the uh, gift that I forgot about. <laughs> that's the same. Go ahead. And um, on top of the SDKs, the API, we actually made it much easier now with 2.0 to create apps on top of Speckle. Uh, we really see Speckle, you know, for developers, especially being a, a technological layer, let's say, for the AC industry. So you can really, you know, fork it, do whatever you want, you know, keep it, you know, use it as a backend for your next. Uh, application and we've seen quite a lot of applications um, being developed already on top of Speckle. We have, you can see on the left, a very simple, you know, a Python dashboard that again reads data from Speckle. On the top right, we have a Carbon tool that was developed at uh, at Arup that does, you know, estimated carbon cost uh, analysis. And again, it picks data live from Revit, so you get out of the box, you get the connectors, the data being sent. You just need to visualize it in, in however you want it. And, yeah, uh, and, uh, and add, add your extra layer of logic on top, right? So yeah. this is... Uh, <clears throat> um, we, we are doing the hard work for you, so <laughs> you don't have to worry well, about that. And that well, usually is getting data out of AC software, right? Yes, in a, in a semi-structured way that's transparent and developer-friendly. Let's say I think that's Beckle's main purpose, in a sense. Cool. So these apps. Okay. Now there's a lot of boring technical slides because we thought that actually uh, this audience is mostly hackers rather than, let's say, uh, end users. So bear with us. And also, like, feel free to shout at us if we're like going too much into depth. Um, so what's the model around Speckle and what's kind of the architecture of the whole system? Basically, as we said so far, you know, you've got apps, apps, you know, going the data from these apps goes into Speckle, and then it goes back out into other apps. It gets consumed by other applications. Um, and this could be could be either desktop connectors, AC software, it could be a web. Yes. That you develop. Um, yeah. So these apps, exactly like these diagrams, are quite incomplete. Anyway, but these apps can be kind of in a sense so like these apps are how we see them from a speckle perspective they're kind of of uh, three types like there are apps that could talk directly natively to speckle language there are apps that could use essentially 
they could define their own schema and they could agree in between each other if they want to use this schema. There are apps that actually, the majority of the AC apps and how actually we're kind of bridging back to the past is with this kind of uh, speckle kits, right? So I think we're probably gonna get this question. How are we dealing with the schemas? What are the schemas that speckle uses? And in short, we do have a schema, it's called a speckle object, but it's actually a kind of movable component within this kind of speckle ecosystem. You can bring your own schema, you can define your own schemas. Because actually what we see is like kind of the value of a schema or of, of something is mostly in the schema itself, but the other half is the implementation. And this is what these converters are. What they do is kind of they translate from, let's say, a Revit beam to a speckle beam and back again, right? Um, so this is how actually data is actually being produced by the desktop application connectors that we showed earlier, like Revit, Unity, grasshopper and so on um then the next step out of that after that if you've got this data okay you can see already speckle as a system kind of disappeared there's no more central blue box there um there's uh there's a step which is serialization and then at the other end obviously there's another step which is deserialization and actually these steps i, I mean i'm highlighting them because like we we usually take them for granted when we hit control s or save in in software but <laughs> it's quite difficult actually to bridge the balance between doing control s and saving to a binary opaque blob versus actually doing control s in a fast and efficient way and being able to take that data and put it somewhere meaningful and how and, and store it in a way that's kind of queryable and transparent afterwards and this is actually where we decoupled again the storage layer from from things so when Matteo was mentioning earlier the speckle server that's one of the transfers that we support right so data gets serialized and decomposed which is a long topic and then gets sent into one or more transports which by themselves can have more transports behind them if you so choose to and these transports are essentially what allows you to if you really want to like create your own backend to speckle, right? We have a couple of default ones like the speckle server transport. We've got a disk transport that actually writes files, JSON files to disk. <laughs> We've got a uh, community contributed MongoDB client. Uh, what else do we have? Ah, an SQLite <laughs> transport. Mateo wants to hack a Amazon S3 transport. So that essentially when you send data from Speckle, you can essentially send it to all those places in parallel or however you choose to do so. Um, and now, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about like how we serialize and decompose data because again, yeah, it's, uh, it's not a simple problem. Usually data is structured and has some sort of meaning within the applications themselves, or however the, let's say, producer of this data kind of structures it, that structure contains some sort of meaning and relationships. They're, those relationships are important, right? Nevertheless, we are kind of very, let's say, uh, object-based. So we want to have all these independent objects. So every part of a little building, we want to be able to access it independently or at the same time kind of group it and query and so on and understand the relationships between them. So this is where Speckle actually has, through the process of serialization, it actually also decomposes data. So if you flag certain properties of an object as being detachable, then Speckle will actually detach these objects from their parent object, insert a reference in the original object and kind of push the flattened list to the transport. Um, now, this is kind of an evolution over what 1.0 we call the immutability of objects. This is where objects where we see them in Speckle as immutable. So if you have a beam with a certain set of properties, uh, we hash it and that's its ID. If you change any of the properties, the hash changes. So basically in the eyes of Speckle, you essentially have a new beam. Um, this allows us to do a lot of kind of magic on diffing and sending just deltas around and all that stuff um that's kind of boring optimization anyway how we actually store this data like what's the kind of construct behind it is essentially a speckle object if you're familiar with git you know like git has like at its base there's uh 
four sets of objects, but like the most important two ones, let's say, are the blobs, which are essentially the files themselves. And then there's the trees, which are, is in the case of Git, Git has it easy. It's the folder structure of your, in on your, on your hard drive, right? So speckle, in speckle, an object is both the blob and the tree itself. So each object contains its data, as well as kind of all the information required to reconstruct the relationships behind that data. And in this case is all the kind of the references and the hashes of the objects themselves. And this is actually how we managed to afterwards actually deserialize and kind of recompose that specific object. Um, so yeah, that's how this very simple diagram starts to unfold. <laughs> we thought it might be interesting um now we also wanted to discuss a bit like how we're like our relationship with open source and what we understand of, about open source and this is why we have this couple of slides at the end um so speckle is an open source project at the same time speckle is also a company now uh which a company needs to pay salary it needs to pay salaries and all that stuff so how do we kind of bridge that barrier so far we've been actually really lucky so we can we are full in open source and we believe in this mission actually of democratizing data for the built environment right we this is kind of our core let's say value we hate that the ac industry is like kind of very well, present company excluded, right? And now we're preaching to the converted, but <laughs> um, we hate that the AC industry is like full of kind of smoke and mirrors, number one. And then number two, those smoke and mirrors are proprietary and it's uh, very difficult to see through them. And it's a very kind of, um, instead of being a collaborative environment, it's a very adversarial environment. Like even AEC companies whose core mission is to, you know, design the Sydney Opera House, like engineer buildings and, and make beautiful spaces and cities for people. They actually see your average grasshopper script or your average Python script as kind of like intellectual property to be cherished and, and, and protected to the ends of the earth. So we, we really don't like that attitude. And we see kind of that, that attitude coupled with the current situation is how like you end up with a very little essentially innovation in the industry. So that's why we're, 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 we're gonna stay open source or die in the process um, of doing so. We've aligned essentially our missions to like, how are we gonna make money? Well, we're gonna sell out, you know, turnkey speckle servers. <laughs> There's no secret sauce there, right? Um, as you may know, maintaining servers and infrastructure around these things, it's, it's not trivial and it can't really be made trivial yet. There's no kind of double click uh, speckle server dot exe and <laughs> you have a production ready, fully secure server. Um, that's kind of the business model around um, essentially speckle as a company. Um, so this is where we're at actually. Ba -bam. And uh, that's where we stop and we start taking questions. If there are any, of course. It's quite a bit of silence. I'll turn on my microphone, that tends to help. <laughs> yes. After me, is there anybody with some questions? <laughs> I'll get started then. Um, oh, you yeah, have the, questions. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, the integration with Blender, that happened very quickly, didn't it? Well, um, it's thanks to Tom's villains and uh, Easy. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking, as far as I could see on the forum, that was just a few days. Was it yesterday? Um, yeah. Possibly. And on the open, on, on our own forum, it was yesterday. Ah, oh, on your forum, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yes. Well, actually, Tom, so Tom's villains developed a 1.0 Blender client, um, so we had in the past a one a Blender client, and now together with Easy, he procrastinated from his current job as a postdoc, and he did the 2.0 Blender client as well together with Easy. So, um, okay. apparently, That's doing this. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, then. It's a slightly more technical question, which I'm kind of thinking you probably answered and I probably didn't understand. And that was, and that was how do you maintain full um, data fidelity 
when you're moving things around and have to get everything through your own data structure. Mm. What what do you call your data structure? You had an expression for it. No, it's a blob and a tree. <laughs> the tree blob, okay. well, whatever the, you call it. Blob. Ah, you probably mean the speckle kit itself. Well, our vision around interoperability is that we don't want to go like uh, it's lossy interoperability, and it's always going to be lossy. That's the reality of how the world works. So, um, essentially, for example, you send a Revit wall, you send it, and you receive it in Grasshopper, or you receive it in Rhino which Rhino has no idea what the wall is. Rhino is just a solid modeler, right? What you will get out is the shape of that wall. And if the host uh, application allows us to actually attach extra metadata to its objects, that wall will have all the garbage that Revit attaches to that wall. So it's wall type, it's family, it's what, what not, blah, 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 blah. So, if you send, and then you know, it becomes a completely new wall. Obviously, it's no longer a wall in Rhino. It's it's actually a box. <laughs> so there's no there's no. Can we talk about two way translation? Mm -hmm. You can. That's a yes. question. I mean, so the, the 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 blob that thinks it's a wall in Rhino, mm -hmm. does Revit know that that thing when it, if it comes if you send it the other direction, does Rhino does? Oh, sorry. So Revit <laughs> produces a wall object. You package it in, in your blob tree uh, monster yeah. and send it over to Rhino. And Rhino ignores a whole lot of the, the buried treasure of data there. Mm -hmm. um, somebody changes something in Rhino, sends it back to Speckle, back to Revit. Mm -hmm. How much is left? Like, how, how much can Revit understand what's coming back? I assume you can reproduce the same ID number, but that would create all kinds of problems. Um, yeah, we could probably replace that Revit wall with a new instance of that wall coming from Rhino. But actually, you know, information gets modified in as it's as it's being communicated in between actors. So from that point of view, that's where Speckle's immutable approach is quite important to keep in mind. So you send your wall, it goes into Rhino. Rhino changes it just by the fact that it interprets it in one way or another. And then when you send that data out of Rhino, it's going to be new data, right? So Revit might not understand at all that that's a wall. The workflows that we support usually in here in this direction, for example, what a lot of people we've seen using Speckle on is like essentially getting data out of Revit, bringing it into Grasshopper, cleaning it up and processing it in a sense, and then sending it out to a structural analysis software, right? And then from that structural analysis software, they bring the structural analysis results back into, let's say, Dynamo. And Dynamo, based on that, they assign specific beam types to the Revit elements. So it's kind of, and it's, it always goes forward. It's, uh, it's right. never. Okay. It's a one way stream. Yeah. Right. So essentially, okay. let's say the interoperability depends in the end uh, between the communicating teams let's say there's nothing let's say uh, i mean okay even in between two companies maybe you have different teams inside these companies and they have their own schema that they communicate well in arup yes exactly like in arup when we were there there were like a couple of object models inside one company they had multiple object <laughs> models that were serving various <laughs> kind of the geotechnical team the structural team the i don't know the, the facade team they all had different ways of structuring and kind of composing their data um then bureau happled has the bureau happled object the bomb the building's habitat object model then ironically we've seen very little of ifc actually being used for this kind of uh, use cases um but yeah, that's it. And then exactly, this is what we try to allow you to do with Speckle as well. Like you can compose these objects on the fly, like in Grasshopper and Dynamo, you have ways to actually dynamically compose these objects, just like you would a JavaScript object, just like you the Python dictionary. Um, and this is coming, it's also like um, observed from, from my research as well, but that's very academic in a sense, like um, as we communicate, as people communicate, they always optimize the language that they use. So you always like, if you 
to take that metaphor into the space of AC, like let's say I'm a structural engineering company and I talk with a steel manufacturer. As I keep on discussing with him and I build a relationship with him, we're gonna use increase, increasingly more efficient uh, ways to exchange this information to the extent that at one point, I'm just gonna send you lengths <laughs> and beam types, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and that's it, right? And possibly scheduling deadlines, for example. Right, so it, it's um, and this is something that we've observed that in AEC you really is very difficult to have this flexibility in, in in language, so to say. So you really need to. This is what that's why Speckle is very flexible in this regard. Right, uh, create your own objects, modifying them as you go. You know, build on top of those things, and as these things solidify and as these kind of patterns emerge, you can start encoding those patterns into well-defined schemas if you so want. Um, yeah, that's um, it's kind that's of the like, philosophy. like the opposite of uh, IFC, where IFC you have already the schema, let's say, that you have to follow. Yes, I mean, from my experience, IFC allows you to to extend it and so on, so it's it's good, but um, it's very difficult to penetrate the kind of uh, the um, let's say the barrier that IFC is in terms of documentation, grammar, and so on and so forth. Right? Like with Speckle, like you have a JSON object, you can like put it into this JSON schema generator, and then you've got a schema that you can validate whole things against afterwards. With IFC, it's like kind of a, um, you have to dig deep, right? And we, I think this is where Matteo and me are like total developers, and we, we just want to like, you know, add, remove properties to our objects continuously, which sometimes is bad, obviously. Um, but this is how, how, how we evolved. I guess yes, there, and is, there is space for both, let's say, approaches. So. Yeah, yeah absolutely. definitely. I mean, I this is where... Anton, I think Anton has a question, if, uh, if we can move on. Ah, I've discovered the little chat thing. Okay, cool. I tried the raise hand feature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I'm really amazed, and I've looked at the speckle before. Uh, stumbled upon the repositories the .NET repository and stole mm. some code there, I think, a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but my, my, I really wonder how how the performance is. You talked a bit about optimizations. I can imagine mm -hmm. having like a Git-like structure on these. How, how is it working? How How is it performing? Well, quite well. I mean, we really, well, quite well because also our object model is lean. Right, so we, we're not um, we're not fattening the beast. Uh, we're keeping things very simple for our for our benefit to offer this kind of seamless interoperability that, that we keep on mentioning. Um, but it's fast, like sending. I don't know, like I, this is on I'm on my MacBook, but like sending, let's say, a Revit model. I'm just gonna share my screen, so like we can experience this in live. Uh, it's fast, right? So like <laughs> sending a big Revit model, like going, churning it through all the conversions and uploading it to Speckle and uh, um, and getting it back out again. Like it's quite um, fast. For example, yeah, we're doing a lot of things to to optimize uh, data transfer. So we are caching a lot of data locally. So if you're receiving the same stream multiple time. You know, this and most of the data doesn't have to be downloaded again. Only whatever has changed. Has yeah. Changed so, again. so, so this is a this is a test model, right? I'm just gonna click view. So now, oh, uh, um, ah, is a test model that doesn't work? Okay, I should remember this. Not to use this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so okay, let's hope this one works because I've been like spamming this. Uh, no, this one doesn't work either. Come on, I'm embarrassing myself. Let me go to <clears throat> where I hope that actually things uh, work properly. So yeah, this is the model from Blender that I showed earlier. I'm going to click view data, boom. And actually, how much uh, happened in the background, I can refresh. So I mean, these are optimizations that happened also like kind of in the on the infrastructure side of things. So I'm disabling cache and let me refresh this. 
Um, so receiving that model, that easy uploaded to app, which is something like, okay, it's 16 megabytes uncompressed ultimately. Ah, no, that's the whole thing. So, okay, it's probably much less. The actual model itself got on this resolution is gonna be very difficult to understand these things. Tuck, tuck, tuck. So let me do this again, and I will be able to tell you how big that model that you saw is actually is, okay. <laughs> Did you have any specific concern, Anton, on, on performance? Uh, is it, you know, visualizing in the web the models? Is it sending and receiving? So yeah, look. Well, I think it's just understanding. I mean, I'm 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 wondering now where the computing is happening. Where the... well, mostly on the end user side, right? So this is the trick that Speckle does, <laughs> because um, you know, to convert these elements to something that Speckle understands and it's easy for us to then process. Uh, we do the computing on the end user's machine. So when you click send from, uh, there are some videos or GIFs like that. Where is it? Rhino to Revit. So voila, I think this first video here, if you can see it. So basically this is a Rhino model. You select it. Ah, it's just sending the context. Okay, these are our tutorials. Bam. And this is not sped up, I think, because <laughs> there was just 27 objects. And when you get them in Revit, the biggest clunker is that Revit is a clunky thing. So actually baking those objects, like getting them out of Speckle is super fast, but actually the Revit is slow in adding those objects to the scene. Yeah, the, the bottlenecks are usually the, the APIs from the software. <laughs> yeah. So, um, whoops, I'm going to try and find a stream from Revit that actually works. Um... But I would say just give it a try if you're curious and you can yeah. see live. What yeah, yeah, for sure. Sure. <laughs> no, it's what is the... I have some experience from the from, um, um, last meeting was uh, Gonzalo speaking about Compass. Uh -huh. And I worked a bit there uh, where we strive for interoperability between softwares. Uh, and and but on a different level because it's just big JSON files or big OBJs, mm -hmm. and, you know, and and then you have those constraints and definitely no like deltas or or anything like this. Yeah, well, I know. I mean, look, this is the I finally found the model that's loading from Revit. Bam, it's it's done, and this is kind of um, a whole Revit fucking model. You know, I, I, let me just close this because you can't see me. I don't know if you my my screen now. I think it's because I'm sharing stuff. Okay, we're back. Um. So this is a model that comes from Revit, and for some reason, ah, finally, okay. So now it's displayed in 3 js So basically. But everything came together with its data. So just to give you an idea of what's in here, like there's all the windows, all the furniture, families. all the families. Yes. OK, I'm never going to get this section working correctly. But back, like extra stairs <laughs> look underneath, like you know, the, the classic stuff that AEC gets. Um, uh, maybe now, nope, there we go. That's a helicoidal stair there. So this is quite it's surprisingly fast. This was kind of experiments that we were like 1.0 revealed that actually, you know, taking it individual object, parsing it and sending it, it's fast. The challenge now that we had, and that's why I went through all the kind of explanation around transports and stuff, like how do you decompose this? Like if you have a wall with 10 windows inside, how do you put the windows in the wall and make sure that things are still responsive and that you can still then with a query on the server, say, give me all the windows of this building. And you would get them without actually, let's say, parsing through the whole blob right it's just a simple query that operates on the you know table of objects i'm blabbering now sorry no i'm i'm, I'm just amazed it's it's really cool um 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, there was I had, but I think it was on my local server, which is not running now. Like the sample house from Revit, you know, I think everybody loves it or hates it mostly. But that's like, I think, under a minute of actually sending that data from Revit. And then actually getting it back into Revit, the things that actually work because the Revit API doesn't allow you to recreate everything. Um, it's maybe something like three, four minutes, but that's again due mostly to Revit being a <clears throat> lovely piece of software. <laughs> but, uh... That fits. Uh, that fits very well with my next question. Um, well, no. Would, does anybody else have a question first? Polite as me to always ask. So what I'm wondering is what what's been the reaction from the big um, proprietary software vendors? Have they been cooperative or irritated or stonewalled <laughs> or aggressive? Or, and I'm sure they're not the same. I mean, there's a big difference between McNeil and Autodesk. Definitely. What's the reaction been over the years? Well, um, let me just pick about the, the the ones who've been supportive. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll, well, I'll, I'll keep my list here and I'll cross them out one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, so let's just say, I think the general thing is like everybody's, um, you know, like when two dogs meet each other and they smell their behinds, I think <laughs> that, that that would describe quite well what's going on for the past uh, years. And we are the small dog. <laughs> Obviously, yes. Um, I think we're largely ignored, which for us is good. I mean, we don't really care whether they take notice or not. What, where we are looking and where it would be like really helpful for us to in, interact more with them if like partnerships could be set up so that instead of us hacking through their APIs, they would actually develop something that um, integrates with Speckle, right? With a neutral vendor, neutral cloud platform for the industry. Um, but yeah, obviously that's, um, there's a lot of vested interests here, right? And can so like, um, Definitely, there are some provisional yeses and then some discussions, and then we usually get bored of these meetings or they lead nowhere. So um, I get the impression, though, Dimitri, that that sort of obfuscation in the API is that's not such a big thing anymore, is it? I mean, even my impression is even Autodesk is trying to clean up their API. Well, I think they realize that they're losing a lot to others who have cleaner APIs, so then yes. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say, but I'm, again, like kind of the, the APIs that these, let's say, Autodesks of the world offer, like Forge, let's say, um, from our point of view, it's a bit ridiculous because that API, you just send like revit.exe with actually command line parameters attached to that thing. So it's an API that actually spins up a whole Revit monster somewhere to process a Revit file. And for us, this is slightly ridiculous. Uh, that's not really an API. That's a remote control for a virtual machine that has Revit installed on it. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know what to say here. Like uh, ultimately- well, that's fine, you don't have to. So, <laughs> but who, who has been, um, who are no. the partners that you're getting a lot of positive response from and a lot of collaboration with? There was some very good support, especially in the early stages of 1.0 from McNeil, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Luis and Will uh, have been quite helpful in the early stages. You know, I think they stepped back a bit, you know, because Speckle has grown. <laughs> uh, but yeah, McNeil has clearly, you know, played well uh, together with us. Mm -hmm. um, can't say the same. We were trying to have conversations with other vendors. So, you know, if any of you listening, is you know or, you know an employee or or you know have as contacts you know we're more than willing to to have conversations um we are trying to position ourselves you know as neutral as possible that's also why we step out of our so that you know we are an independent company you know we're trying not to be enemies with anyone and we really want to support all the developers of the ac of ac companies and vendors alike you know in building you know a better AC, better digital AC of the future. Um, so, yeah. yeah, 
but yeah, there's um. So what about geometry? We got a question in the chat. Um, it's funny, actually, Thomas. Yeah, it's a good question. In 1.0, it had and it still has. So there's two ways to go about it. Like geometry, definitely, they're the atoms, let's say, of, of let's say, everything AC, more or less, right? Um, it could have, if you so choose to, a special significance, but not really. Like you will lose out on, for example, seeing your meshes and your lines and points in 3JS in our online viewer if you don't use the default speckled object definitions for geometry. But other than that, that's all you lose. Um, and what formats are supported? Where we have, yeah, points, lines, blah, 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 polylines, NURBS, meshes. Um, Breps. Breps, yes. But like the, the trick there, like, are supported. Like breps are not supported in the 3D viewer. Uh, we support them between Rhino Revit and Rhino itself. Uh, how you see them in the 3D viewer, you see their mesh, <laughs> their mesh representation, right? Ultimately, everything that goes on a screen is a bloody triangle somewhere. Uh, but yeah, so, um, you know, we, you could build on top of the kind of the existing definitions of lines, points, and circles that we have, if you so want to, for example. And then in that case, geometry, yes, would have uh, like kind of a special significance. But Speckle is completely agnostic to that. You could come up with your own definitions of circles and use that as well. Um, that's because, yes, there's actually We've been in arguments in how to define a circle quite a few times, and we want to stay out of it. We're getting up on the hour. Um, did mm -hmm. you have who else has uh, something they'd like to say? I can see that Izzy is here. Thanks for your work on the Blender integration. I think it is mute. Who's got, um, has anybody got a question? Otherwise, I've got two left. <laughs> Two left. Oh my god! Yeah, okay. Oh, I always have lots. Um, yeah, well. um, I, I guess the one that I personally think is quite important for quite a lot of the projects that we're looking at in OSR um, is funding, of course. And you've talked a little bit about funding. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me like the most sustainable model at the moment for this type of project is basically selling a managed server. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I get I get the impression that projects have to be extremely large before they can earn money selling support. But making people's life easier by selling them servers or selling them infrastructure seems to be the way it's being done. Um, you can comment on that, of course. But how does that scale up to the really big companies who don't want someone else to run their server? They want to have their own one. And, mm. and I see as well, there's kind of a, a bit of a conflict there in, 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 your, in your, like you don't have a vested interest in making it easy to spin up your own Speckle server. So there's a bit of a, an interesting well, dynamic there. <laughs> yes, definitely. Like, but actually we've just published public Docker images just because we got the server in a proper place, uh, more or less. Yeah, I mean, they're nice people. And we're nice people. Uh, so but what, what we realized at the end is, you know, you can give the recipe to everybody. You know, it's like making, you know, a complex dessert, a complex dish. You can give the recipe out, but you know, not everybody is going to be able to get the dish that you ate at the restaurant, right? And for us, it's the same. So some companies can, some companies that maybe have a large IT department or someone very skilled within, you know, their... Uh, their team, they're able to deploy their own Speckle servers, maintain them, you know, update them when it's needed, fix bugs, and even, you know, pu push back some some of the fixes to the main repo. But most others, they're just able to, you know, spin it up locally, play around with it, and then as soon as there's, you know, uh, migration to, to be applied on the database, you know, they, they start having issues. And that's where, you know, we see uh, potential in, in, you know, <laughs> in revenue for us, which is selling the servers. Migrations, I'm always typing about that. Migrations are actually super easy now, for now. Like, I mean, we, we, we took care of that, even, <laughs> even that. So, I mean, the dynamic there, yes, we obviously don't want to make it as easy as possible, but ultimately we're dog putting ourselves in this regard quite a lot, right? So we've spun up servers for universities, which by the way, 
you know, if anyone wants a free speckle server for educational purposes, we can do that for you. Um, so we've spun up speckle servers for university. We're, 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 we need to spin up a server every time we run our tests <laughs> in the CI, <laughs> right? The bottlenecks are in places where actually there's no way to make it easier than can like SSL certificates. Like, yeah, you need those. Like we really, we could help you out with there, but like, if you don't have a domain name that to point it at with an A record, like we can't, you know? And these are the things that actually will stay complicated forever, right? It's not, um, it's not up to us. And for us, it's again, it's a waiting game as well, because we've done some back of the napkin calculations. Like if we go to, let's say, big enterprise, like the size of Arup or Royal Haskoning or something, and they have their IT department handling, you know, tens of speckled servers for various projects in top secret places. Like the cost to them is much higher than the one that we could offer, for example. So from that point of view, you know, or for that matter, like, I mean, they could also, you know, you know, if you're smart enough and if you have like a DevOps uh, normal person that knows how to do DevOps based on Docker and based on containers and all that jazz, you're kind of set, you don't need us. And that's fine because our mission is to kind of um, push this much out as much as possible because more the more people use speckle the less people let's say use forge and proprietary solutions and that makes us generally happy and that's our mission <laughs> yeah i guess if you make it if you get if you make it easy for people to to do to make use of all the solid functionality you can have fun exploring the new functionality together with the, the people who want to pay you to do that yeah, that's, totally. that's where the fun is, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course, we we're reaching actually to get rid of this, uh, to move to our next uh, next stage, which is kind of park interoperability and keep it on maintenance level because it's solid enough, and go towards actually starting building some cool apps on top of Speckle, the likes we. We could just show quick videos and screenshots because uh, they ended up proprietary in various places. So, yeah. Well, that's really good. We're we're hitting the one hour mark. Um, does anybody have some final comments? Otherwise, I'll let, uh, let you guys, uh, Dimitri and Matteo, sign off or whatever we call it. Thanks very much for being here. It's um. I think, what are we up to now? 25 people at a time. That's pretty good. <clears throat> cool. Um, well, yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for I the invitation. Mm -hmm. It's great having you. Um, I think it's one of those projects that is hard to wrap your head around, like the <laughs> topologic project that's uh, written about. <laughs> oh, 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 <laughs> yes. There are some things I just don't quite understand until I've tried using it myself. But um, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let you know when we're, when we're ready to spin up a, a demo server on um, OSR's domain sometime. Sure. Ah, we're uh, starting to look at how to how to get funds for doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> cool. More than happy to help. So. And I yeah, and actually, we to I told Izzy like she's gonna bug you about Blender stuff. Actually, her mic is not working apparently, but like you you're gonna get pro possibly some naggings from us no problem so. thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for accepting the presentation and but it's very, it's it was very due huh? thank you as well for having us so. and for any for anyone who's watching and wondering um there should of course be links to as many of the files that we can uh, get the get the speckle people to send us so if they're not <laughs> exactly. together with the video where you are watching then come and visit our forum and ask and we'll have them somewhere Cool. Yeah. Thanks very much for this evening. Um, bye bye. Ciao, guys. Take care. And that's and that's where the video cuts. Good. <laughs> <laughs>